Okay, so I think it's time to start this uh, session on the phage and uh, nanomedicines. My name is uh, Yokai Kwe. I'm a senior physician in intensive care and working at the Bern University Hospital in Bern in Switzerland. And so I was asked to take over the chair of this session uh, from Viola Fogel, we cannot, who could not unfortunately make it. So we have, uh, I think ahead of us, a very uh, exciting uh, session uh, on page, and I hope uh, you, you will be uh, as interesting as I am in this uh, in this topic. So we have first, and we'll start with uh, Alexander Arms. He's junior group leader at the Biocentrum in at the University of Basel in uh, Switzerland, and he has been working with uh, bacteriophage and uh, with a, a special emphasis on um, on uh, bacterial persistence and uh, torrent cells. So really looking forward to uh, his presentation. So maybe some uh, technical uh, uh, things. So a question can be asked. There is a, a button on the live stream. And then we'll, we have a three short 15 minute presentation. So what I was the, think of is that we, uh, we collect all the questions and then we have a 30 minute debate that we can, where we can answer and, all the, and uh, go through all the questions one by one. So please, uh, Alexander, so the floor is yours. Yeah, Yoka, thank you for the kind uh, introduction and thank you to the organizers for the, for the invitation. Uh, my talk is entitled Fighting Chronic Bacterial Infections with Nature's Finest Nano Machines and uh, in this conference and in this session particularly, nature's finest nanomachines are, of course, bacteriophages, the viruses infecting bacteria. But since we have a very broad audience, I'd like to take one step back for a very short introduction. We've all become aware in recent years of the power of viruses. So what you see here is a virion, a viral particle of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that is causing COVID-19. And um, we always see these pictures in TV, but it's not always clear what they actually mean. So I like to argue that uh, Viral particle virion is basically a USB flash drive with two major parts. It has a robust container for data storage, which is in case of the virus, the envelope of the virion. And it has a host binding function to trigger the data transfer, which in case of the SARS-CoV-2 virus is this infamous spike protein. And the software in this case would be the genome of the virus, which is basically some kind of a pathogenic software that converts the infected host cells into virus factories that would then produce more viruses and eventually get killed. And uh, we know these things for SARS-CoV-2 and it applies in exactly the same way to bacteriophages, which are just the viruses infecting bacteria. But all the concepts are basically the, the same. They are totally harmless to humans, but they are very efficient and effective in infecting and killing bacteria. There's a huge diversity of uh, phages out there, hundreds of millions of uh, different types of them that you can see here some drawings of the major types of these phages. You see some of this typical moonlander architecture that you knew from textbooks. Others look a bit more like a SARS-CoV-2. So there's a huge diversity out there. And a very small number of these viruses, bacteriophages, has been studied since um, the middle of the last century as uh, typical lab models. And um, they were used as model systems to unravel all the basic principles of life, how life works at the molecular level and gave us a lot of tools also for molecular biology. So if you think of restriction enzymes, CRISPR-Cas9, or a Cre-LOXP that is used to make mutants in mice, or T7 RNA polymerase, this use of protein expression. These are all things that either come from phages or from host defenses against phages. And then what my group is trying to do is we try to go one step further to look at the natural diversity of phages environment to maybe find other interesting tools and tricks for biotech or for clinical applications but also just interesting insight for fundamental biology. And while typically we try to use standard lab conditions to look at bacteriophages, we look at more diverse conditions that might, for example, mimic clinically relevant uh, bacterial physiologies to see how this affects phage infection. Where do we get these viruses from? So we go sampling out in nature. That's a very romantic picture, but many of our phages actually come from sewage. Didn't put a picture of that here or we do many high school student projects that then help us sampling with uh, many hands. And then we grow these phages in the lab, isolate them, and then we sequence them, we analyze them phylogenetically, and then systematically phenotype them. And then we don't just randomly isolate these phages and study them, 
but you look for phages that have very specific properties that could be useful for certain applications. For example, for therapeutic applications, which is relevant for, for today's presentation. And here you think of phage therapy, which is basically the use of phages to treat bacterial infections. And we're not clinicians, so there we will hear more from uh, Yokai, for example, later. But the basic principle is very simple. You have a sick patient that has an infection, and then you give that patient phages that could kill the bacterium that is causing the infection, and then you would have a cured patient. That's in the ideal world. And of course, this is a topic of rising relevance because in the current crisis of antimicrobial treatment, bacteria have evolved all these different ways of uh, dodging the bullet of our classic antibiotic drugs. And this increasing resilience to antibiotic treatment is causing high morbidity, mortality, and also economic losses. So unless you have lived behind the moon, you have seen in recent years that the media are covering more and more of these phage therapy case studies. This is actually reflecting a real movement also in the field to apply this more, more broadly. We are working with chronic bacterial infections, which is a kind of very typical way, a very relevant way, but also very specific, and how phages could be used to, to treat those. I want to quickly go one little step back to first look at how antibiotics work before we look at why they might not work. So antibiotics are just pharmacological drugs. They have a target in the bacterial cell to which they bind. And then they do typically not inhibit that target, but they poison or corrupt it to unleash some kind of a dominant negative activity to kill the bacteria. And then bacteria can have antibiotic resistance, which are different ways of preventing the drug from reaching the target or they can be antibiotic tolerant, which is a number of mechanisms to prevent the poisoning from happening to kill the bacteria itself. And this typically involves some kind of a dormancy or a low energy physiology of the bacteria because then the targets that could be poisoned will be shut down. This is like if you're riding a bike, you think you're recycling very fast, somebody throws a stick into your wheel, you will crash very badly. Well, if you're moving slowly or not at all, not a lot will happen from that stick. And antibiotic tolerance is relevant because it's the way how these persister cells survive antibiotic treatment. So these are phenotypic variants of normal bacteria that are in a dormant state, shown here in red. And if you treat these with drugs, you see all the regular cells are dying. These persisters, they are surviving. And when you terminate the drug treatment, these persisters can wake up and replenish the population. This has been implicated in all kinds of chronic and relapsing infections, like a Urinary tract infections, notorious for this, they can be caused typically by E. coli or device-related infections that can be caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which I'm highlighting because these are the two uh, major lab pets that we are studying in my group. So to show you some data on this, if we grow E. coli or Pseudomonas in happy cultures in rich medium, they are easily killed by antibiotics. I'm not showing you this here, unless they are resistant. But if we take dormant, non-growing, stationary phase cultures, the picture is very different. So here you see uh, bacterial cells, see a few per milliliters plotted over time. If we treat E. coli with the beta-lactam and pisilin, dormant cells, you see there is no killing observed over 48 hours. For the aminoglycoside topramycin, there is also no killing over time observed. And ciprofloxacin of fluoroquinolone kills around one log of the bacteria before it hits a wall of very deep dormant persister cells. And we see the same picture with Epsidibonus aeruginosa, the beta-lactam meropenem does not kill at all dormant cells. Tobramycin has very little activity in this time frame, and ciprofloxacin can kill some of the cells, but also very far from um, clearing this infection. So what we wondered is this high antibiotic tolerance, does this also affect the application of bacteriophages for phage therapy? So we did the same experiments with bacteriophages, and what we see is no matter what kind of phages we take out of the fridge or out of nature, Growing cultures, happy bacteria and rich medium, they're highly sensitive and they can get killed by the phages unless they are resistant. But um, if we infect dormant cultures, we do this like at a multiplicity of infection of 0 0.01. So it's one phage per 100 bacteria. Then over time, we sample viable cells or surviving bacteria, free virions or infected cells. I'm showing you here the results for just two major groups of E. coli phages in blue versus red. It's always two different phages. You can see in the free virions, so PFU per milliliter sampled over time, that basically the number of free virions drops dramatically in the first minutes of the infection, which indicates that these phages easily absorb to these dormant non-growing bacteria. At the same time, you see the infected cells are rising dramatically 
in the same cultures, which indicates that the phages, they can inject their genome, so after which we will detect these cells as being infected. But you see there is no replication. So after this initial phase, the infected cells do not increase any further, and also the free virions do not increase at all. So there is no fate replication happening in these cultures. There is also no bacterial killing observed at all. So this indicates that since there is no phage replication, there is no killing. And what we see is basically this. The phage injects the genome into this dormant bacterium. The genome sits there in the very ill-defined hibernation state. And then if nutrients resuscitate the host cell, the phage wakes up and kills the bacterium. So that's, of course, nice. But what we might also work in vivo, but it would be much more interesting to have phages that can directly kill these dormant bacteria. So basically shortcutting this way. Because understanding this, what not only enable us maybe to select phages that might be more effective in phage therapy or engineer them, but it might also, if we understand this, how this works on the molecular level, give us an inspiration to make better drugs against uh, this kind of infections. So the student working on this project in the Amafa in my group, he was sampling many phages and uh, worked with lots of natural samples, and he never found any phage that could replicate on dormant host cells. Until one day, we took a sample from a pile of rotting plants behind the Hernley Cemetery in Basel, where we found one phage that we call Paride. And Paride is a huge phage. It has an almost 300 kilo base genome. So it's like nine to 10 times the size of SARS-CoV-2. And this genome is largely composed of so-called dark matter. So these are genes that have no obvious predictable function. So this is kind of a virus on the dark side of the moon. But if you put this into our cultures and do the same experiment to very quickly guide you through this, we have again here bacteria over time. You see the dark red cultures with phage paradigm. You see that this phage can kill two locks of these dormant bacteria. It can much more nicely kill growing cells, but it can also kill two locks of dormant bacteria. And we see also very strong phage replication in these dormant cultures, while the other phages always stayed down here after the initial absorption. You can see this in the cultures very visually. We have here a very dense, deep dormant culture of Pseudomonas aeruginosa that is highly antibiotic tolerant. And if you add this phage, this culture will clear up from the lysis of all the bacteria. I think that's quite, quite impressive to, to see that. So two locks of killing, that's nice, but in any clinical setup, that is not enough to reach any real effect. So we wondered whether we could boost this by phage antibiotic synergy, combining the phage with antibiotic drugs. And we tested different things and interesting meropenem was very relevant. So the drug alone here, the black curve, does not kill any bacteria because they're a deep dormant. But if we combine this drug with parida, we can actually, after a while, totally sterilize these deep dormant cultures. And I think that's very impressive, and I'm not aware of any other procedure short of autoclaving the culture that could achieve that. Of course, autoclaving is much faster, but you can't do that inside a patient. So what we are doing now is that uh, we are trying to explore which physiological barriers are these phages facing in dormant hosts that make them hibernate, and how does this work? We are studying uh, what PARID is doing and um, how it can overcome the resilience of these dormant bacteria on the molecular level. And what we can learn from these things to, for example, improve the treatment of chronic infections with phages or with drugs. And with this, I'm at the end. I'd like to thank my group who did uh, this research. Today, I showed only the work of uh, Indian Maffei, a very talented PhD student in my lab. I thank Phage Paradev for joining our group in a very critical moment of our research, our funding and support, and to our collaborators in Switzerland and abroad. And I would be ready to take questions later in this uh, discussion and debate session that we will have. So thanks a lot, Alexander, for this, this very uh, exciting and interesting presentation. For sure, it's the tolerant and persistent cells a huge problem. And I'm sure there will be many questions. So please don't hesitate to, uh, to uh, put your question in the chat and then we'll so we'll collect them and we'll discuss them during our 30 minute session. So now it's time to move to the next speaker, uh, who is uh, Carl Merrill. Carl Merrill has, has, uh, is, uh, long, has long been working in the phage field as an NIH uh, research associate. And now he's working uh, as a chief scientific officer and also in the director board of APT, a phage company that is uh, putting phage forward 
especially in the US, but I hope maybe we can discuss this later, it will come to Europe. And so uh, we are very uh, exciting to hear you talk uh, that and you will be talking about uh, artificial intelligence and whether this can help match, have the matching between phage and bacteria. So Carl, you can share your presentation. Let's see. Um, yes. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, the, um, let's go right on to the first slides. <clears throat> the, the problem is that, um, you know, when you look at the history of, of our ability to treat infectious diseases, uh, it, it's not that long ago, uh, 110 years or so from the time that Robert Koch first did, realized that uh, diseases were caused by bacteria till now when we were getting antibiotic resistance to the antibiotics that we've isolated and, and used all these years since then. Um, the, the problem is that um, the bacteria have had over a billion years, four billion years to develop defenses against the uh, whatever it is, whether it's the bacterial viruses or the antibiotics, because the antibiotics we don't invent in general, uh, they're made by funguses. And, and they've been around for quite a bit of time too. And so, uh, for instance, um, there's a, um, the, the British like to collect things. So one of the things they collected were feces from uh, soldiers during the, the First World War and they froze them. And they recently uh, thawed one who, uh, from a person who died from, they thought, cholera. And they were able to do genomic sequencing. And sure enough, it was cholera. But he also had the beta-lactamase genes in him. So he would have been he would have not been able to be treated by penicillin, uh, although penicillin wasn't introduced until the 1940s. So the point is, these antibiotic resistance and phase resistance uh, things are already out there. The reason that I decided that I wanted to try to use phage is that there's such a large number on the planet. There's approximately 10 to the 31. I didn't count them individually, but it's easy to do the calculation. Um, and you know you can isolate them from natural sources, um, and we can make sure that they are only the lytic ones by by collecting plaque, uh, uh, clear plaques. We we test them to make sure that in a in an effective clinical screening procedure, which has to be done fairly rapidly, and we're still working on that uh, in conjunction with other groups like the Mayo Clinics, etc. Uh, and their sequence because. Phage can kill people. In fact, they killed one third of the children in New England in 1850, 1735. It was called the, the Great Throat Distemper Epidemic. And in fact, we now know that was diphtheria because the Karenibacteria diphtheria, the bacteria is totally innocent. It's only when it's infected with the, the phage, beta phage, the phage carries the toxin gene. And, um, and in fact, that toxin gene has mammalian promoters in front of it. And uh, Leticia Benigore in Buenos Aires has sound, found the same sort of thing in Shigella, in the Shiga toxin. Again, it's carried by phage and, um, and, and it can kill the animals just as well, either as the DNA or the phage without the bacteria at all. So it, that's why it's critical to sequence all of these. Now, the, the, this is, Huh, that's interesting. The, um, this didn't show up this time. But anyway, the, the bottom line is that uh, the, the antibiotics, you know, as we know, we're running into a problem because we're getting resistance. The fixed cocktails yesterday when I gave my talk, I pointed out with uh, Tom Patterson, who was one of the first patients that was, we used this collection of phage on. Um, there were 98 phase for the Acinobacter Bumani he had, but only four of them worked. So what are the chances that we would have put together a cocktail uh, that would have worked um, if we had limited it to a few of them? Um, and, and, but the personalized phase, you can always find phase that'll work, especially if you have a big enough library. Uh, there we go. The real problem we have is this problem of time to match. Uh, right now, it takes us about... Um, it, at the best, uh, 18 hours, um, but very often it takes even longer than that. So the question is, could we do that quicker? And that's why I got interested in, um, it's a turnaround time. 
And that's why I got interested in, in uh, well, how are we going to decrease the turnaround time? Um, and there, there are two technologies that could help with that. One is genomic sequencing of both the phage and the bacterial genomes. And, and that can be done very quickly now. Uh, and in fact, some hospitals are already doing that to look for antibiotic sensitivity in the bacteria. Um, and then computer hardware is advancing, so that would help in this thing. Um, so there are three basic approaches that you can use for computers. One is by searching for genetic homologies. And there are a lot of papers out there already on that. But the problem is that viruses tend to pick up uh, epitopes or genes from, from their hosts. And, um, and in fact, we even see that with COVID-19. A lot of the genes in COVID-19 ha have shared por portions of the human genome. That makes them more stealth-like anyway. Um, but the problem is that, um, that it's, it still will not get you, it, it will get you close to what you want, but not to, to be able to say this virus is going to work against something else. And that paper I have represented right there with Dean Scholl and myself and Shankar Aja, uh, that's an example of this kind of thing. You have a whole set of E. coli's K1 through 5, and, and the big difference is that the, the, the outer capsule, the polysaccharide, and there are different uh, E. coli phase, T1, 2, T2, et cetera. And they've evolved to attack those, those polysaccharides. Um, so the question is that there's, there's no homology there. And, and so that technology would never get us to the point where we'd find which one would work. Um, the other one is to find correlations between the bacterial defenses and, and the phase uh, offensive mechanisms, but that that's going to take a long time. A recent paper in Science Magazine in 2018 pointed out there are thousands of, um, of defense systems that are yet undiscovered. In fact, a lot of what we call the dark genes in the phase are just for that kind of thing. And not only do they have to get into the bacteria, but they compete against each other too. And so the next question is, look, this is complicated. Can we just use artificial intelligence to, and, and, the, and use the genomic sequences of the viruses and of the bacteria and, and, and go at it that way? Uh, so that, 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 that to me is really the only real hope we have, although that's gonna be difficult. And I realized something, and, um, and that is that um, in the 1940s, John von Neumann and Alan Turing were developing the first real computers. And, um, and, and Turing said, you know what? The computer is nothing but a calculating machine and I, can, and I have code. If I made the code infinitely long, uh, then the, the machine, if I kept running it forever, it would carry out all possible calculations in the universe. And he called that a universal computer. And in fact, that's now called a Turing machine. And von Neumann said, hey, I like that idea. What if we put a translating device in there and that'll translate whatever is going through this machine and it'll make little machines, wiggly machines somewhere or other, and, and they might copy this thing and, and that'll become a universal constructor machine. That's as far as they got because they didn't know anything about DNA or anything else. But in fact, if you think about it, that's exactly what all life on this planet is. We, instead of having zeros and ones, we use the four bases, whether it's DNA or RNA. And the translating machine, we call that the ribosome. And the difference between a virus and a non-virus is that the viruses uh, don't have ribosomes, and that's why they're an obligate um, uh, parasite. Uh, and the 20 amino acids is what they're, the translating machine is copying it into. They wiggle around, and, and they can copy things and do whatever is necessary. Um, so um, that just reiterates what I just mentioned there. And, and it's interesting because it, life has been on this planet almost 4 billion years, and yet that code in general has stayed constant. There are some variations of it, provincial languages, if you want. Some phase have differences. Some of the mitochondrial genomes have differences, but in general, it stayed the same. The other thing that's intriguing to me is that all uh, in life, all of the amino acids rotate plain polarized light to the left, and all of the sugars rotate it to the right. Um, so it, if you think about it, 
the, the, in the case of the phage and the bacteria, they're playing a game. It's, I call it the game of life and death, or life or death. Um, and in fact, um, it, it's depicted in, in Lewis Carroll's book, Through the Looking Glass. It's called The Red Queen Race. And, and if you remember, Alice falls down a rabbit hole. And when she gets to the bottom, she meets the Red Queen. And the Red Queen says, here, dearie, it's different than up above. Here, if you want to stand still, you have to run as fast as you can. And if you want to get any place, you have to run even faster. Well, that's what it is to be alive. You're constantly competing and, and having to keep running. Um, when you think about it, AI systems have been able to do incredible things. They've been able to, to take care of complicated games that humans spend a lifetime trying to learn, like chess and Go and Shogi. And, and they've done it just by knowing the basic rules and they'll play the game against themselves and they'll learn how to do it. And they'll beat most humans at these games. So if they could do that, why can't they do this with, with the phage and the bacteria? I'll tell you right now before I go through any more slides, it's, the problem really is not the computer, although it, the, the, they're getting better and better and the, and the better they are, the, the easier it'll be for us. The real problem is, the, is humans taking the time out to sequence all the genomes and of both the phage and the bacteria and developing learning pairs, ones that work and ones don't, don't work. And until we have that, that collection, it, you're not gonna be able to teach a computer. It can't teach itself. Um, and, and so that's basically what we need. Um, the, the, as I said, the, the, the bacteria self-constructor machines and the phage are self-constructor machines that lack their own translator. As soon as they get in something that has a translator, a ribosome, then, uh, then they can take off and then they can play their game of life and death. Um, and, and that's really the, the bottom line of, of what's necessary uh, here. And, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people are trying to do things halfway in between, but I, I, in, in some ways, I, I suppose it's disappointing to have this presentation because you'd like to have the answers, but we don't have the answers and I'd like to at least define what the problem is. We can get the answers. I've run into people who have, uh, there's one individual not to be named. He, he went around the world collecting pathogenic bacteria and sequencing them. He worked for a big pharmaceutical company. And then for whatever reason, he had to retire and they destroyed the whole collection. So it, it, without people realizing that we, you know, we can't afford to do that, we've got to concentrate on this, whatever it costs, we're, we're going to be in trouble. So uh, thanks a lot, Carl, for uh, this uh, this presentation. Very interesting. It's uh, for sure an, a new field that is uh, opening, and I think the power calculation of our computer will maybe help us to solve this uh, race of life death. So, uh, so this, uh, and but let's see uh, how it comes, and let's discuss this uh, later. So uh, now it's time to move on to uh, my presentation. So I think we had at the beginning a basic presentation on how we to isolate phage and how to use them to combat persistent infection. We had this initial uh, point of view with you, Carl, your presentation, Carl, and what could be the future, how to develop a new, new pathway and pipeline for phage therapy. And I will take the, the clinical point of view and, and see how phage can help patient in the daily life and is it possible or are we hoping so too uh, too much so what we can so let's move I hope. Okay. so so uh, I, uh, that was already mentioned during uh, both presentations the problem we are facing and especially at the bedside is the problem of antibiotic resistance so in the past, we had uh, quite easy things. We had a lot of new antibiotics coming onto the market and we have very few resistant infections. But now so things are changing and we are facing a post-antibiotic era where we have more, a lot of resistant bacteria, a lot of resistant infections, multidrug resistant, sometimes pan-resistant, and we have very few antibiotics coming into the market. And that's bad for the future. Because if we think that an estimated such a number of 
people are dying from antibiotic resistant infections, in the future it can be even worse. So we have to find solutions. So there are several solutions that we can think of when we are facing antibiotic resistant infections. The first part is to get more of out of existing antibiotic. Maybe we can use better the tools that we already have and the drugs that we already have. For instance, for beta-lactam, we can think of extending the infusion rather than doing them as bolus infusion. We can monitor what we're doing in the patient, especially when they are critically ill by uh, making a therapeutic drug monitoring. We can think of other way, alternative way to give antibiotic. For instance, of pneumonia, we can inhale antibiotic. And we can also try to modify the drug to repurpose the, the antibiotic. But on the other side, we can also think of new strategy. So with uh, therapeutic antibodies, antiviral strategy, we're not, where we are not uh, targeting uh, essential genes, antimicrobial peptides, new biomaterial. But today's talk is about bacteriophage and lysines. Alexander already mentions in the first presentation that phage therapy is only the use, therapeutic use of lytic bacterial viruses as antibacterial agent. And uh, so, and so what is very interesting in the case of antibiotic resistance is that the activity of phage is independent of antibiotic resistance mechanisms. And you have the life cycle with the phage, which is uh, absorbing on the bacterial surface, is injecting the, the genetic material, and you need an active enzymatic machinery of the bacteria to make a new variant. And at the end, what we want as a physician is to have the bacteria killed. And this, the phage is doing this by releasing the variant. And then you have the cycle uh, going on again. So you can have a kind of auto-amplification of the um, auto-dosing effect of the phage. So just a few words comparing antibiotics and phages. So, and the development of new antibiotics molecules, especially in the, in the, currently, is uh, costly and time consuming, whereas the development of phage is fast and cheap. Antibiotics are, uh, are non specific, and the target also commands in flora. And uh, from, from this, you have multiple side effects, whereas the phage is highly specific. They are target only some strain from the same species, so they have narrow spectrum, and but. On the other side, the advantages have no side effect. But from this narrow spectrum, you should isolate the bacteria to have the right phage for the right target. Whereas for the antibiotic, you don't need to do this because they are so broad spectrum. So even you, you, you can have empirical therapy being given. Antibiotics are, when you give them, there are fixed doses, whereas the phage, they have the self-replicative effect and autodosing effect that might be of clinical interest. So if you look at the landscape, phage have been discovered far more before the, uh, the discover of the, anti the first antibiotic. So there, was a, there were already phages being used in the pre-antibiotic era. But then as the antibiotic were coming so far, the new antibiotic and new molecules were coming into the market, so phage disappeared because antibiotics were reliable at that time, and there was no resistance. But now that the resistance is growing and we are facing this multi-drug resistant crisis, the interest on phage is rising. And so either we can have new molecules, but it will be time and it can be costly to curb down this antibiotic resistance, or we can think about how to uh, use this phage, these bacterial viruses to our, for our benefit. So, there have been three randomized controlled trials, which is the gold standard to evaluate any therapy and coming to the market with a market authorization. But all three failed. And so we have to discuss why this failed and why this, uh, so why is that so? Such, uh, what, why, what the, the causes, where the causes are of this failure. So Nestle did the first randomized controlled trial assessing phage. To, um, to um, treat diarrhea that performed the study in Bangladesh. And there was some pitfall in the trial design. So their targeted patient had polybacterial infection. 
And so they had to stop at 50% of inclusion, so it was underpowered. The, 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 they had problem of product stability. It was, uh, it was even per oral, and there, were, there was a problem with the gastric acidity. The quality was non-GMP products or good manufacturing product. And the problem, so they did not do any phagogram before inclusion to check for innate phage resistance. So there were polybacterial infection, no phagogram, and only a minority of patients had an E. coli diarrhea to which the phage were targeted to. So development of phage resistance was analyzed but not observed, and they didn't perform any PKPD study to uh, define doses. And there was the second RCT, which this was the Fagoban trial published in 19. And the problem the trial designed was an insufficient sample size. Very few patients, I will discuss in detail this trial in the next slide. There was a big problem of product stability, shelf life. So at the end of the trial, patient received 10,000 less phages that was expected. The product was still GMP or GMP-like. Form. So there was no phagogram done before inclusion. So 50% of the stones were resistance at the time of inclusion, which was a major drawback of the trial. Development of phage resistance was not investigated in this trial. And the uh, phage PKPD were not performed before, and phage were given topical. And the last one is the one that uh, was investigated phage for the treatment of urinary tract infections, was published in 20. So the problem in the trial design is that the placebo was doing well and even better than either the antibiotic treatment group or the phase treatment group. So the question so were the, the patient, uh, what is the, was it the right patient population where the patient infected? Product stability was not a problem. The, the product was not GMP conform. So they did the FAGO run before inclusion. So that was not a, a drawback of the trial but they did not look to development of phage resistance and also PKPD was not performed and the phage were given intravesical. So now if, uh, if uh, just as example, we can, I would discuss the Fagobram trial. So where I was involved in, so it was a trial that was assessing the efficacy and the safety of a bacteriophage uh, cocktail against burn wound infections uh, due to Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And patients were randomized to receive either standard of care, which was a, a silver sulfadiazin dressing, or phages. And both were given topically. And then, so the, the main outcome was the survival of bacteria within the burn, and also how fast the, the bacteria will be clear from the burn wound. And if you look here, so the standard of care was quite good at clearing bacteria and reducing the bacterial burden within the burn wound. Whereas the phage therapy was, uh, took a long time to, to start having an effect. And then when it had the effect, it was limited to 50% of the patient. So the first thing that we thought of when we were analyzing the data that there was a problem of the shelf life and the phage has to wear such less quantity they have to replicate before having the effect. The second thing that we look at here at the inclusion of the patient to the, the strain of the inclusion. And we, we noticed that most of them were on the patient who failed the therapy, where the therapy failed, the strain were resistant. So it was two problems, shelf life and resistance. So now, so does it work? Because three randomized critical three failures. So we have to think about. It. So recently, the Belgian group published a systematic review and they are investigating safety and efficacy of phage therapy in difficult to treat infections. The population was a uh, difficult to treat infection with previous failure of a standard of care treatment intervention that they analyzed phage versus antibiotic versus standard of care or placebo. And they included not only RCT because there are only few, but also observational study, core study, case series, and case report. They spent 20 years, so from the 2000 to 2021, and the end point of the meta-analysis was tolerability, short-term and long-term adverse event, and efficacy, subjective or objective clinical improvement, or both. So what are the conclusions of this? Um, so first, phage therapy is safe. Phage therapy is well-tolerated, and 
only few adverse events are reported, which is something good. But now when it comes to efficacy, so we still see a clinical improvement in this. So in 50% um, uh, in, in, in some instance, and, uh, and again with bacterial eradication. But there is a major drawback because there is a high heterogeneity between the study and there might be also publication bias because they included case series and case reports when we know that most of the case series and case reports are, have a positive publication bias. Second, a second important limitation when it comes to phase therapy efficacy in this meta-analysis is that almost two thirds of the patients under phase therapy were also under broad spectrum antibiotic. And third limitation, most report outcome parameter were poorly defined. And so were only a short follow-up. So if I try to conclude and to, to see what, what is the evidence, we have very, very good evidence in animal model that tested efficacy, single field versus cocktail and menstruation route. We have a good evidence in case report with all the uh, positive uh, publication bias, but to, the evidence in randomized control trial is very, very little. So how can we change this? So what we did, we, we say, so let's uh, step back for a moment and look at the preclinical model of infection. And we did a systematic review and meta-analysis that we, are, uh, we have been submitted. Uh, now it's uh, under um, um, review. So we, we looked for preclinical model of, uh, that evaluate phages infections. So the most model were evaluating phages in, uh, in rodent within a systematic setting, sepsis model, or in a pneumonia model, and with Pseudomonas and Staphylococcus aureus as main pathogens. After excluding a, a paper of low quality with high, uh, high risk of bias, we, we ended up with 124 publications to be analyzed. And with the, we, we, we then restricting this to 50, uh, almost 50 uh, publication with low to moderate risk of bias. So we analyze any, uh, some of the outcome and I will just concentrate on the survival at 24 hours in systemic infections model. And there was 11 publication looking at this. And you see that phase therapy here is highly um, it's a, a efficient in preclinical model of infection targeting systemic infection or sepsis. It's not only efficient in increasing survival, it's also efficient in reducing the, the bacterial load, for instance, the skin and burn infections. And what we came also through when doing this meta-analysis is that in preclinical model, what is very important is time to inoculation. The shorter the time from phage therapy administration to inoculation or start of the therapy, the better the outcome is. So now if we try to translate this, the preclinical model with the clinical RCTs, so the majority of the study that investigated phages in the animal were single phage, even at a single dose. And the, the three RCT investigated multi-phage cocktail that were administered repeatedly. Second, the selection of phage for the treatment in preclinical study was uh, determined by uh, rationally with phagogram to evaluate in vitro testing before therapy and conventional or standard RCT evaluate the therapeutic product established and validated by ethical committee prior to the start of the trial. And last, most preclinical study targeted acute infection settings where time to treatment likely influenced phage efficacy. And we know this in the hyper acute or acute setting, phage therapy requires sufficient time for the identification of the causative pathogen which is not possible in the human settings. So now uh, we are facing kind of a valley of death and we have to think how to do this. So I think so pre and ready to use co uh, phage cocktail, although they are broad and not um, uh, 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 suitable to, for phage therapy. And we have to move to, move to summers or personal therapy. And that's why I think the artificial intelligence to match phage and, um, and, and bacteria and to have the shorter turnaround time because uh, treatment, so time to treatment, time to phage treatment is highly important. I think this is, might be a good avenue to fasten 
and shorten the turnaround time. But then if we, if we look at uh, uh, personalized therapy and, um, and we compare to a pre tap of the already to therapy, we have regulatory bottleneck because here we know how to do the RCT with a fixed active ingredient. We have a fixed starting material, fixed specificity dosage and A versus B trial. Whereas when we think about personalized therapy, we have one patient, one product, we have changing starting material, then we have this particular autodosing of the phage, and we have a personalized product versus B trial. So there are some questions that we have has to be answered if it comes to regulation. So Belgium tried to answer this with the magistrate preparation, where they had a phage bank lot, where they select the phages that they produce this in a controlled environment, and then it was it is given by the hospital pharmacy under the umbrella of magistral preparation. There is another concept in Israel where they call this clinical phage microbiology. They recently published where they isolate the pathogen that tested this, and it, it takes still 24 hours. And then you have an effective treatment, yes or no. And then if it's yes, it's given to the patient. If no, it's going back with this back loop. Well, the, I think the, uh, are talking about two very important things. So we have to test phages with preferred antibiotic because phages are being given in combination with antibiotic. And then what they also said is that patient serum samples should be assessed for bacteriophage neutralization. So there are a lot of uh, concepts that has to be, have to be developed to uh, overcome the regulatory problem. And this is something that we, we can discuss further in the chat room. So I want to finish by acknowledging all the people that are working in the lab. And uh, with this, I'm at the end of the presentation. So I stopped the screen sharing. So now I think we, we should have received a link to move to the question room. And then so we, uh, we can... Uh, click on the link that we receive in the chat and then we'll be moved to the uh, questions or the chat room where we can discuss all the questions. <laughs>